You may be seated in the presence of the Most High God. Amen. Hallelujah. That song was just right on for me. Victory belongs to you. Have you ever been in a crisis or, or been under attack? And I'm not talking about maybe you were disobedient or you were living in a, a disobedient state, but you had finally got right with God. You had finally started living the way he is calling and asking you to live. You have your prayer room set up. You're praying, you're reading your word, you're, you're coming to Bible study, you're, you're, get, you're mentoring, you're pouring into people, you're discipling, you're right in the place where God called you to be, but yet you're in the midst of a crisis. And you know what to do. You know what to do when an attack hits, amen? But you find yourself in the midst of a crisis. Well, this morning we're going to look at a, at a man. He was the king of the southern, um, the southern kingdom of Israel, which was called Judah. And his name was Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was a good king. And when he got, took the throne, he, uh, he turned Israel or Judah back unto God. And he began to put in place different things, such as he set judges in place to judge the people in the way of the Lord. He put priests and, and teachers in place to teach the people the word of the Lord. And he also set up an army to protect the territory from people that would come in to try to start a war with him. And so he seemed to have it going on. Now, he wasn't perfect like you and I. We're not perfect but he was following the ways of the, the Lord matter of fact the word says that his heart was devoted to the Lord and so he loved the Lord amen but then as you read on you find he comes under attack he comes and faces a crisis now if we go to second chronicle chapter 20 we're going to see what the Lord is going to say to us this morning about dealing with a crisis or an attack. So here Jehoshaphat, he's a great spiritual leader and he's facing a crisis. And if we look at verse 1, the author says, after this. So after all that I just said about him, leading Judah back to the Lord starting a revival in the place people are learning and growing and getting to know God for themselves the relationship with he and God was great and the author said but after this and he goes on to say after this the Moabites and Ammonites with some of the millionites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat some people came and told Jehoshaphat a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already in Hazazon Tamar, that is, in Gedi. Now, why would that be a crisis? Like I said, he set up armies, and, and even the, the surrounding nations feared them. They were powerful and wealthy. Why would that be a crisis? Well, what is a crisis? A crisis is something usually that, that comes and, and blindsides you, that, that gets you off of your game, that, that you've least expected. Now, if we look at the scripture carefully, we'll see that it said the army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. Now, I'm not good with geography. However, what I learned was that they, were, they actually came around through the back door. So Jehoshaphat was not expecting anybody to come that way. And so it was not guarded or protected. And so he was caught off guard. He was blindsided. And then the word said it was a vast army. And it was a huge army, bigger than his army. So he was caught off guard. He was blind sighted. The word also says that, that the army was already in En Gedi. 
Now, En Gedi was very, very close to Jerusalem. So this huge army came around through the back door. And now they're knocking on the door about to bust in. Crisis situation. Amen? He was caught off guard. He was blindsided. He was not prepared. So he became afraid and fearful. But he knew what to do. The first thing he did was he sought the Lord. And he prayed. And then he called for the nation to come together at the temple in Jerusalem. And, and he called for a fast. And so the whole country, men, women, boy and girl, they fasted. And they came to the temple. If you remember, the temple is the dwelling place of God. So they were in the presence of the Lord. And they came before the Lord. And Jehoshaphat began to pray. He knew what to do in the midst of his crisis. Amen. Huh. So why do we care about this message? Why do we care? Most of you know my family story. A few years ago, my husband went in for a physical and he came out finding out he had what's called multiple myeloma, which is a blood cancer. We were caught off guard. We were blindsided. Amen? <clears throat> a few months ago, I went to check on my son because he was sick. He wasn't feeling very well and he had lost a ton of weight. He's 31 years old and he was diagnosed with colon cancer. And if anybody knows anything about colon cancer, you normally don't even get checked until you're 50. So we were blindsided. We were caught off guard. And then about a month ago, I was home. It was on a Saturday. My mom hadn't been feeling too good a couple of days, but not unto death in my mind. And I get this frantic call from my dad to get there quick and to bring that, the ambulance. And I live seven minutes away, and when I got to the house, I could still to this day see the paramedic telling me I can't go in because she didn't make it. I was caught off guard, blindsided. You see, as believers, we find ourselves in crisis regardless of our spiritual maturity. We see Jehoshaphat, he had it going on, so it seemed he wasn't perfect, but he finds himself in a crisis situation regardless of his spiritual maturity. And so I'd been praying and fasting and seeking God, and all he kept telling me was the battle belongs to him. I want to know what's going to happen, right? I want to know what the end's going to be. Amen. He said, the battle belongs to me. But what's the end going to be? The battle belongs to me. So finally, I said, well, all right then. This means war. This means war. Amen. I know I'm not the only one going through a crisis situation. I know somebody out there is going through a crisis situation. You're, you're praying, you're fasting, you've done the things you thought were right. You, you have that relationship with God, but yet and still, you're caught off guard. But this means war. Can you put my big idea on the screen, please? My big idea says, as believers, when we find ourselves in a crisis we are assured victory because our battles belong to the Lord. Our battles belong to the Lord. Oh, that's shouting. That's shouting. Hallelujah, God. So let's see what God really wants us to know by looking at Jehoshaphat and his situation. So the army is this huge big, gigantic army is at the back door knocking on it and Jehoshaphat doesn't know he knows that he cannot 
defeat this army on his own, so he seeks God. And as they pray and wait for God to respond, because they're not going to leave his presence until he answers them, he, he begins, through his prayer, and we're not going to read his prayer, but I would ask you when you go home to look through it because it's a great model prayer. He's reminding God of what he said. He's reminding God that he had given them this territory. He's reminding God that, that those same enemies that are after him, God had previously told Israel not to take their land. And that same army that was coming after him were the descendants of Lot. Remember Lot? They were descendants of Esau. Remember Esau? So actually, another thing that caught him off guard is that this big, huge army is related to him. They're his cousins. Great, great ain't him. <laughs> yeah, coming in to take their land. And so he's praying and he's telling God that he would have to, to pronounce a judgment on them. And so what we're going to look at this morning is God's response to the prayer. Let's begin at verse 14. And I'm going to read 14 and 15 from the NIV. And so Jehoshaphat has just finished praying and they're waiting for God's response. And, he, and the word says, then... The Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, the son of Mattaniah. And you know why I had to read all them names? Because of this. A Levite and a descendant of Asaph. So Minister Tyree, he was a worship leader. Amen. We know Asaph does music. So the Spirit of the Lord came on the worship leader, Jehaziel, and he said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Can you put a point to don't be discouraged because you know we can easily go there. Amen. Especially when God is not answering the way we want him to. Don't be discouraged or afraid of this attack, of this crisis, for the battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. So my second point is this. As believers, when we're in a crisis, we have to first understand it ain't about you. It ain't about you. <laughs> Hallelujah. According to Exodus chapter 14, God himself fights for Israel. Now let's look at some history. So you can understand why I'm saying what I'm saying. Here they are in the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a holy city. And we remember Solomon built a temple in Jerusalem for, the, for God to dwell and so they're living in the holy city. God gave that place to Judah. And God is dwelling there. It is his city. And this army is coming in to attack and, and take the city. Now what we have to understand is in biblical times, wars were fought over territory and inheritance usually. They did not declare war. They would just come in and seize the territory if they could. So, if the battle belongs to God, it's because the attack is on God himself and not the people. So it ain't about you. Did you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit? And so when the attack and the crisis comes, the attack is not about you, but the God in you. So it's not about you. Amen. I was all in my feelings and I was so sad about my son because that's my baby. Amen. And God was like, it ain't about you, boo-boo. 
<laughs> it ain't about you, so dry your tears. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we, the, the, the attack is against God. Paul says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Amen. It, it's all a spiritual thing, and, and sometimes it's to develop our faith and our trust in God. And so I remember, you know, going through, going through a crisis or, or an attack, a lot of times, especially if there's a, a call in your life, sometimes the way people respond to you, it's, it's funny. They'll say, well, you already know. I mean, you might be really feeling sad and need a word, but they'll say, but you already know this and you already know that. But when I looked at Jehoshaphat and I saw the fact that he still got afraid and he was still alarmed, then that lets me know it's okay to have those feelings. It's okay to be sad. Yeah, it's okay to be fearful and alarmed. But what we do know is that we know what to do, and that's to turn it over to the Lord. And so I've been, I was praying and praying to God and trying to get answers and trying to see what I did, what I could have done. And I kept telling God, I love you. I love God. You don't love God? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I just kept telling God that I love him, but I'm a mother, so I'm hurt. I'm sad. I want to know what's going on. When, when this situation happened with my son, and he just kept saying the battle. And I'm like, okay, but I need more. I need more. And here's what he said. Trust me. And I still ain't got my answer. But he said, trust me. Trust me. That brings me to my second, my next point. Verse 16 and 17. <clears throat> and this is still the worship leader prophesying. He said, tomorrow, march down against them. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeriel. You will not have to fight this battle. He's saying it again. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance of the Lord. And the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem, the deliverance. I read that wrong. Take up your position, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. He's saying that again. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow and the Lord will be with you so as believers when we're in the midst of a crisis we have to learn to trust God with our lives trust him with everything we have so I emphasize the word tomorrow because I kept saying well why tomorrow if I don't have to fight why don't you just do it today you know why we gotta wait they're at the back door knocking, knocking. Why I got to wait? Tomorrow. What's tomorrow? Tomorrow is our future. Tomorrow hasn't came yet, so it's the future. Tomorrow, march down that he wants us to trust him with our lives. And, we, and he wants us to trust him with his plans for our lives in his time. So tomorrow, tomorrow could be our destiny. Tomorrow, march down there. And when you get there, here's what I need you to do. So when we're in the midst of a crisis, we have to learn to trust God with our lives. Do you remember when the Israelites were in captivity? I believe by Babylon, I'm not... 100%. And Jeremiah was the prophet. And he had prophesied to them that they would be captive for a number of years. 
And then later God told him to, to let them know that he was going to deliver them. And while they were still in captivity today, God said to them, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future while they were still in captivity. So we have to trust our lives to God because tomorrow he's going to do something and he needs us to be ready. And we have to trust that on tomorrow he will be there. So he says something else. So when we go out tomorrow, you got to do three things. Take up your position, stand firm, and see my deliverance. Take up your position, stand firm, and see my deliverance. Somebody say that with me. Take up your position, stand firm, and see the deliverance. Yeah. Take up your position, stand firm, and see. Now, that sounds like a passive thing to do. I thought he was going to say, when you get there tomorrow, give me a sword, cut them all up, whip them all up. He said, no, take up your position, stand firm, and see. Now, let's look at those three things, because I believe that's going to I don't know about you, but it has helped me. I don't know who's here and needs to hear this, but it helped me. And so take up your positions. All three of these things are verbs. That means there's an action word. I don't know what kind of action you need to, to take your position and to stand and to see, but if they're verbs and they were given in the imperative mood, which means a command. So take up your positions. It means to stand. It means to be, I'm going to have to read this because it's deep. Be in a standing position, implying one stays in the same position for an extended period of time. It means to stand firm. Be in a state of firm inner strength as an extension of being in a standing position, and get this, not moving or running away. So when you're in a crisis, you can't move or run away. Yeah, some people that get hurt, they don't want to come to church no more. Do not move or run away. Take one stand. Listen, take a defensive fighting position. So I did get to get my stance. I just couldn't do nothing with it. Get in a defensive fighting stance. And you know the defense waits. As an extension of being in a standing, staying position. Stand ready for service to authority. Huh. As a function of worship. It implies subservience and submission. Oh, come on now. I need some more amens. It says to stand in a service to authority as a function of worship, implying subservience and submission. So when you're standing in your position, it's you're, you're subservient to a, a, an authoritative figure. Okay, huh. that part was deep to me, and that it's a function of worship. Now, I could go on and on about church people getting mad, leaving the church, mad at the pastor, or something gone in their life, and they don't want to go to church, but I don't want to talk about y'all. I'm just going to talk about me. <laughs> going through my crisis there were so many, many, many days I wanted to just lay in my bed and wallow in my pity and not come out here and do nothing. 
I did. But I saw that passage. Even before I saw the passage, God said, take your position. I'm a worship leader. Take my position. Yeah. In the midst of my hurt and my pain, take your position. And I have to, to wallow here because it was just so deep. When I did the grammar study on this, the grammar analysis, the MIT class, I appreciate this. It said it was given in the middle voice. Now, what in the world does that mean? It means that the subject both acts and is acted upon. So if I am to take my position, I'm the subject, so I have to act and take my position. But it says, and then it's acted upon me. So as I become subservient and submissive and I'm worshiping, I'm doing it out of obedience but the middle voice says, then it's done to me. So after a while, I'm not just doing the act. I'm really becoming submissive and subservient and I'm worshiping because see, while God is handling the, the enemy over here, he's also working on me in here. No, it's probably not really about me and the attack is on him, but he has allowed me to go through this. And so there's something about me that needs to be worked out. So as I take my position and as he's over there handling the enemy, I'm becoming subservient, whatever it is that God is calling and, and trying to get me to, to be. Hallelujah. To lead me to my destiny because tomorrow when I march in and take my position, I also need to stand firm, which that word still is pretty much the same. It means to stand up. And it means to stand motionless. That means I can't be trying to help God out. I just need to stand, like he said, motionless. That takes a lot of energy because I'm a doer. I be wanting to help, help God out. I want to do some stuff. <laughs> I got to move around. So take up your position, stand firm, and then see the deliverance. Now, this is a Hebrew verb for to see, and it's often used in the literal sense of seeing with your eyes, watching God work. It's also used to, to, um, to signify a divine revelation where people are said to have seen God or seen God work. Have you ever just seen God work right before your very eyes? And so tomorrow when we go down and march down to face the enemy, we need to take our position, stand firm, don't move, and just watch God work. And while he's working, like I said over there, he's also working over here, in here. And so we must trust God with our life, with our life, with our future, with our destiny, with the call, with the plan that he has. And so he told Jehoshaphat to wait until tomorrow and and march down and watch the deliverance. And so that brings me to my final point. You got it up there? The next one. As believers, when we're in a crisis, we have to realize that praise is the voice of faith. <laughs> Praise is the voice of faith. And so when the worship leader, I like saying that, when he stopped the prophecy, when the prophecy was over, Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground 
And all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down and worshiped before the Lord. Then some Levites, worship team, choir, from the Kohathites and the Korahites, they stood up and they praised the Lord, the God of Israel. Well, check this out. With a loud, with a loud voice. <laughs> we don't always have to turn our sound down, y'all. With a loud voice. Because praise is the voice of faith. And the people began to praise God today for what he was going to do tomorrow. Because mind you, they hadn't got there yet. So they began to praise him today what he was going to do on tomorrow. They began to worship him today what he was going to do on tomorrow. They really didn't know what he was going to do or how he was going to do it, but they worshiped and they praised him anyhow. So I'm going to ask the worship team and the band to come on up here because we're going to praise God today what we believe he's going to do tomorrow. <laughs> 